So chapter three um, is was just a review of some of the modeling fundamentals. They start about they start with talking about how um, some of the conventions that were used um, in S from um, Hastie's and Chambers publication back in 1992 are still very relevant today, um, but also some of the pitfalls of some of those basic modeling um, methods and how there was never really a formal convention um, kind of dictated. So it allowed a lot of developers to create the conversions and, not, and allowed for a lot of inconsistencies. Hence why, you know, there are, and he has a table where there's like um, 10 different functions that practically do more or less the same thing from different packages. Um, so the learning objective for this chapter uh, from the book down book is uh, highlight the formula syntax in R. Um, some of the convenient conveniences, sorry, that are supported. Um, some of the um, tests that you can do, like ANOVA, the summary function, the predict function that are used to um, help, whose metrics can help you um, get information from your model, either whether you know one's different from another or if you just want to get summary metrics, things like that. Um, the purposes of the model formula, um, how tidy models com comes off of the tidy verse uh, designed for human designed for human rubric, and then some examples of how they mesh um, very nicely. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the formula syntax. Um, the beginning of the tidy models of our book starts with an example using some model data called crickets, and he's looking at the temperature between rate and species. Um, I mean, sorry, temperature and species. Um, looking at the rate of chirps. This particular example in the book down, um, they um, are using a new data set called trees. And uh, this comes out of the tidy models packet, I believe. Um, and this is just some very basic um, information on the data frame. So you can see it's a table, it's a 31 by three table. He describes how you uh, measure girth of a tree um, or volume. Um, and so he did a correlation to look at girth and volume and see that it's quite strongly correlated. Um, 96 percent, uh, and uh, he plots the um, girth versus height of the trees um, with the volume as its uh, grouping. So the volume, the bigger the plot, the bigger the dot. Sorry, um, the more trees there are with that height and girth. Um, Okay, so then we start to get into the linear model function, um, trying to predict volume as a function of the other two features. And it's using the LM function. Um, and you can see that there is this uh, formula here where the syntax is volume tilde dot. Um, this syntax, is basically using that all encapsulating dot that we talked about last time um, that lets you just put in whatever is specified in the trees. It's a type of like, um, and we, we were just mentioning um, Sham, Shamshuddin, Sham, Sham I'm sorry, I, I can't say his name very well. Um, how he was able to clear up him and Max the the dot syntax, um, the, the the thinking behind that. Um, so he did a very simple linear uh, um, model looking at the relationship between girth and height and the coefficients um, and the intercept. Um, and then 
if he poses the question, so how would you write this formula with, um, how would you write this without the formula syntax? So this is like a very, um, in the book, he, Max and Julia, they point out that this syntax is symbolic. And I actually have a question posed to the group um, because I want to know whether they meant it just symbolic in the sense that like in symbolism or symbolic in the sense that in the R in the R way, like it is a symbol, like as a name, like these are independent objects, not like you're not going to do girth plus height, like you're not going to do this math. These are individual symbols. So I had a, I, I kind of put in my own notes of this chapter a little question mark when they say in the chap in um, in section three point one that the formula is symbolic. So, anyways, um, it's kind of a little bit out of order on um, this section versus what's in the book. Um, that's okay because he goes over how, how to write it out, how you would normally write out a model formula, and then the shortcut with um, like this using the the dot. So um, I guess Tony went uh, did it backwards, um, shows what the shorthand like the shortcut looks like, and then says how would you write this without the formula syntax? And like this little book down wizardry that I didn't even know existed. Um, so I learned that this little drop down thing that you can spot. So <laughs> I really like this meme that he puts in here. Um, so basically you would have to literally type out volume till the height plus girth. Instead, you got great being like, we like that dot. So we're gonna use the dot because it's, it's shorthand. Um, it saves you a lot of typing. Well, saves you keystrokes and saving of keystrokes is, is a good thing, um, even if it's only two uh, factors. All right, so um, then he goes into how to incorporate uh, the pipe um, and then wrap with formula. Now, this, I also have a question. I don't know where to pose these questions. Maybe I should have posed these on Slack. Um, as I was going through the book and then I was reading through the vignettes and also this, the book down, what is the necessity of including like a wrapping formula around the formula? That seems a little redundant. Does anyone have, like have a clue? Because I ran the output both ways and they produced the same thing. I don't know. Yeah. Is it because, maybe, sorry, go for it. Sorry, maybe I was going to say to try to enforce it. That is a formula. Well, maybe it's just, it's not needed, but it's just like a safety measure. And um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, it might be, it might be right. Like, because, you know, he was basically saying in the book that, uh, there are several functions, several methods to make predictions that have um, their arguments are essentially the same. I think they call on the same functions. So maybe with like LM, you it like you pass in the first argument going to be your formula, which in the background is calling on formula maybe like if, if this is like explicitly stating it where I maybe LM is already kind of doing it. Can this it be, be sorry, it's can it be because we are using the dot? So we yeah. use volume uh, yeah. tilde dot. Because if you see the example afterwards, you have LM, but you explicitly say uh, volume, girth, and times height, and you don't use no the one after. Down. Well, it has to do with using the dot in combination with the pipe is the reasoning. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's exactly it because the pipe um, uses the dot as a placeholder for whatever result is getting passed from the previous expression. 
So I think we touched on it briefly yesterday or the last week, but the dot is a placeholder. So trees is going to put, it's either going to get put in your first position by default, or mm -hmm. it's going to get put wherever you stick the dot uh, in your expression. So it's basically piping trees into the data position and then allowing formula volume dot to be the actual formula rather than the um, like first argument. At least that's the way it uh, appears here. So, and there's also, if you, the thing is though, he didn't wrap it in <clears throat> brackets, which is kind of confusing because if you don't wrap it in brackets, still puts it in the first position. Um, you wrap this in brackets? Yeah. Uh, the whole, from starting at LM all the way to the end, that whole expression in brackets. Because when you wrap it in brackets, you can tell <clears throat> the expression exactly where you want the dot to go. If you don't want it to go into the first position, you have to wrap it in brackets to tell it that you don't want it to do that default behavior. Mm -hmm. And then you have to specify where in like what argument you want to pass it to with the dot. Um, but in this case, it's like getting passed as the first expression and as the dot. Um, so I don't know. I kind of want to do like trees, formula, volume, dot, and see if it just gives me a formula with volume, dot, or if it does something particular, I'll do that and have an answer. You, yeah, wanna... um, if you get rid of, sorry, if you get rid, <clears throat> if you just get rid of the data, uh, equals dot at the end and just have the dot follow through. Uh, so getting rid of the, uh, the formula wrapper. And they're just going lm volume uh, function of dot doesn't uh -huh. work. Um, but if you then if you get rid of the formula wrapper anyway and just have volume um, function of dot and then uh, comma data dot data dot. equals dot, it does actually work. It works. Yeah, yeah. So you don't actually need to do the formula thing at all. Um, okay. I think it does make it syntactically stronger to do that though. Um, and it's potentially useful if you wanted to, for instance, capture the formula maybe as an expression. Yeah. yeah. I'm not certain. That, that, that's something that I observed because I did the exact same thing when I was reading, but I, I just, I guess I just wanted to get to know if anyone had like a, a more, like, I guess, in depth understanding of why this, why he put this like this, like a formula like this. Um, because it works without it. So it's, I, I, I don't understand. <laughs> but the, it's, it's really the, the problem that the LM function in the tiny verse thinking would have data as the first argument, but it doesn't. It actually has formula as the first argument, then data, as in default position. So that whole thing about specifying mm -hmm. data equals start is what is the bit that kind of causes this problem, maybe. Well, not a problem, but it makes, makes it look odd. Yeah. yeah, I think that I, I would have to, I would have to go with what August was saying that just to make it explicitly clear that this is the formula in case you know, just to be safe, I guess. Um, okay, so then we move on and we talk about interaction terms and the simplicity in which. You can generate them. So by merely doing an asterisk in between your um, your pet, so your your variables, you can create an inter interaction between them. So here you can see we have girth, height, and then the interaction uh, between girth and height, um, which is basically how um, changes in these affect the overall um, volume. Yeah, excuse me. Um, um, this is a dumb question. Um, I, I don't know what the meaning of interaction here. Um, you don't know. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. What is the meaning of interaction? So here I say interaction terms are easy to generate. I, I'm not sure I understand what is really interaction is. Okay. So yeah, yeah. So we have. Um, basically, uh, in this model, 
before we were looking at how girth affects uh, volume and how height affects volume independently. And then how, when you insert an interaction, you can see how, um, let me see how to put this, you can see how the changes between them affect the, uh, the outcome. I don't know if I'm saying this properly. So if, um, hold on. Yeah. Let me, I had a really good example in my name. Um, bring it up. So, um, Okay, so um, we can have interaction. So basically interaction terms are added uh, to address differences between the intercepts. So like how to, you may wanna learn how a change in an independent variable depends on the other independent variable across and then how that the interaction between them affects why. So, basically helps us if determine if there is a uh, girth effect on height. And if that effect is strong enough to affect um, volume, which is our outcome. So if, if there is a, a girth dependent effect on height or vice versa, does that make more sense? <laughs> So basically, the um, the thing that you end up with, the if the coefficient is how strong that effect would be on volume. I don't know who asked that question, but I hope it was a little bit more clear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we talk about polynomial terms. So um, polynomial terms, my understanding of polynomial terms was that you can have second and third degree interactions. So you could potentially have um, height and girth. Uh, well, you can't because there's only two terms, but let's say there was a third inter uh, variable and you would basically have the interaction two way in, all combinations of two way interactions and three way interactions. Um, but they said they he puts here the use of the identity function, which actually allows you to do math in your formula. Um, so we have so it's a, it's a bit confusing. Um, so volume um, till the girth plus I girth squared. So you're basically, you're telling um, R that this is an actual uh, mathematical expression. So instead of a polynomial uh, like interaction term, so that there's a sh shorthand, so you can do a shortcut to do um, interaction, create interaction variables by doing, um, having your variables so girth plus height and then squared. And then that would create um, your variables in uh, the combination of your variables as interaction terms. Um, so I don't necessarily agree by this statement. Um, they, so I added a little bit here. So I kind of, I did this. <laughs> Um, which is why I was like, I know that wrapping around formula, well, I guess in this case, it's not necessary since not, I didn't use the pipe, but essentially I did squared around the dot. Um, and that shows you that it creates an, that in, the same interaction term. So basically doing um, girth um, asterisk height produces the same 
results as if you just uh, use the dot format square. So, because we only have two predictors, but this does not equal this. So if you want to actually do a mathematical expression, you have to use the identity function within your model. Um, and so I added this part and made a comment. So um, there are only two product, uh, predictors in this model. So it produced the same results um, as interfit, which is what he calls up here. Um, but if there were more than, if there were three, there would be um, three individual effects of the combination of these effects, two ways and three ways, depending on if the, and also depending on if the uh, third variable was a categorical or a numeric. Um, if you want to. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, I have a question about how, this was never really clear to me, even though I've taken, statistics classes, how an interaction is reported. Like it's clear when there's an independent variable that directly influences the uh, dependent variable, but when you have like a multiplicative interaction between girth and height, like what what is that in plain English saying about the relationship between the dependent variable and the two interacting? independent variables. So let's see. I'm going to have to go back to my steps as well. But from what I understand is that there would be, um, it would look at the, the effects how one of the dependent variables, I mean, sorry, in the, one of the, one, how the independent variables react with each other and then see if that interaction, well, I'm gonna avoid using the word interaction, but <laughs> if there, that chain um, has a strong enough effect on the dependent variable. So it's kind of like, together they have some kind of synergistic effect like greenhouse gases and temperature basically sure like you would um let me see though i wish i had thought about this a little bit more thoroughly maybe i would have plot these um plotted these and then you can see, maybe it'd be more easy to visualize the, the togetherness effect. Um, the, um, so it's, it's the multiplier of the two of them, isn't it? So it's yeah. like a coefficient of times together. And then that makes me think that in the, in the example there, it's counterintuitive that both girth and height have negative impact on their own on the volume. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but then together they have additional. Is that that looks weird? The um, yeah, right. I mean, it, it, it makes sense with the way like math negation works, but when you think about like the logical conclusions that would come to that, it's like, wait, how, why, how does that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to look, I'm looking at the book right now and I'm he only plotted the very first example. That would be a good note um, to potentially include uh, a visual on interaction. I mean, we know that like it's a cylinder, right? A tree is basically a cylinder like from that picture up there. So the height, you, you, it's like the diameter times the height is the total volume. So girth interacting with height being positively correlated with volume makes sense geometrically. Mm -hmm. um, what doesn't particularly add up is like why girth alone or height alone uh, does not 
is negative. <laughs> I, maybe it just has to do with like the intercept and the particular data set or whatnot. And it's just kind of an artifact. Uh, maybe that's what it is. I'm not sure. So it, here's a little tidbit. Um, maybe it might help. Uh, in the book, it says, so when he's looking at rate as a product of temperature and species for the crickets, it says the model formula show, shown above creates a model with different y-intercepts for each species. Okay, so he had plotted uh, each species, so he had a plot and- Oh yeah. And that had, it was a GG plot with two uh, smooth lines. So there was, it was a scatter plot by group by species and with a smoother, the, so he did an LM. Um, a linear um, smoother regression line. So basically, he was basically that creates two different y intercepts for each species, and the slopes of those regression lines could be different for each species as well. To accommodate this structure, an interaction term can be added to the model. So on their own, they have different. Uh, the, different, the two regression lines have different slopes. So we want to add an in to we want to add an interaction term to have one combined, like as a combined term. Yeah, so they could have one um, slope, which is um, basically your coefficient that the effect on and why. Yeah, and the fact that the intercept, I remember that now, the intercept mm -hmm. is like odd on that one is because, I mean, it does, it's like nonsensical because it doesn't, they don't actually have data that goes down to like that temperature. Yeah. Um, otherwise the crickets would just be dead, but the mathematical equation that does regression will obviously extrapolate it out Right. infinitely in both directions. And right. so in this case, it's like, you can't have a tree that's just girth, it's two dimensional, or just height, it's two dimensional. It's, that would just be illogical. So girth times height is really the only thing that makes sense because it's a cylinder. And so that's really the only thing to pay attention they to. They depend on each other. Yeah. So the Got volume it. of a tree is going to depend on a combination of girth and height. Yeah, I guess in this example, it clears it up, but like in things where it's not so evident about what you're measuring, yeah, um, you know, like personality traits or things like that, I guess it could still be confusing, but I think that's for another discussion. I don't want to hold it up. No, I mean, you're right. Like what I've often seen people do is they basically throw everything and they work backwards. So they throw everything into the model and on all of the interactions and then do tests to see di like different models to see which, if they're necessary. So that, what is that step uh, back? Stepwise. Stepwise, like backwards, work backwards essentially. Or lasso, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, just like throw everything in there and all, the, in, on all, their, all the potential interactions, which just seems like very nightmarish. So yep. I think that's where we're going to introduce feature engineering. <laughs> that would be a very good uh, introduction for that. But anyway, so yeah, people knew more. that we treated regression models like blenders, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just had one more point. Uh, you all hear me? Sorry, I wasn't sure if yeah. my phone's working. Um, uh, that. I think what's helpful sometimes when you get kind of a formula like that coefficients and interaction terms is to like hold one of the things that's interacting constant, right? And then mm -hmm. plot uh, how the, you know, the outcome looks like along different values of the variable you're not holding constant that's interacting and then do this and then kind of do it at different levels of that other term or vice versa. And then you kind of get a feel for uh, how the slope might change depending on other values of, of values of, of each of the terms that's in interaction. Yeah. So 
What is the syntax for holding it constant in the LM? Sorry, you just, well, you just, you just supply, let's say like a percent, like a quantile value, like, like, um, cause you, cause in the syntax, right? In a formula, you'll just have like each um, a coefficient times one of your variables plus a coefficient times one of your variables, right? Like, plus like, uh, you know, your interaction coefficient times the, the uh, you know, one of your variables that you're interacting times your other variable, right? Um, and then so if you just feed into that formula, right, uh, in all the places you want to hold that one, one of your variables constant, let's say the 50th percentile um, uh, value and the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile, and then you, and then, you know, with those three conditions, you can vary the other, like, let's say you're varying height, and you get, you just kind of see what the, the slope, how the slopes differ. I think it's, it's pretty hard to, for me to interpret like complex formulas like that with interactions without actually doing something like that and feeding in data and plotting it. Um, and so it would literally be just like take out the variable name and just put in like the 20th, the, the value for the 25th percent quantile. Yeah, like a constant. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I think there might well, be scripts around for this. Or, um, I probably could recover a script that does a bit of that. I just need to dig if you're interested. What was that? Sorry, um, I, there, there's probably some scripts uh, quite accepted in my field for graphing interactions in regressions. And I probably could put my hand on some code if you want to see what it looks like. I just yeah, if you have a good tutorial or something not that you could post not not a tutorial, but some, some code, yeah, sure, for sure. Short code, yeah. Yeah, that would be, that would be really helpful. I'm like, I'm taking notes as I present this because I still have questions <laughs> even though I read through this. Um, okay, so moving forward, um, that's, quite uh, simple if you want to exclude a column from your formula, you simply, you can still use the dot. So if you have like 22 variables in your formula, um, you can just simply use the minus sign to, as you would a select function, for example, and um, remove, uh, to remove one of your variables. Um, and then you can also remove the intercept. So if the intercept is not convenient for you or not necessary, uh, you just have to um, add the zero constant, and that will get interpreted as just looking at the coefficients. That would just return the coefficients themselves. Um, now, let me see. I, out of curiosity, we have girth and height. Do they change? They have changed um, when you look at them independently like this and you have an intercept of 69 or even just this, uh, if you're just looking at growth and height and you have a minus 57, uh, the intercepts are negative 57, which doesn't make sense. Well, I don't know if it makes sense or not, but, um, I don't know if that's actually removing the intercept because, or forcing it at zero because the uh, coefficients are different. Um, here, correct. You have, we have 4.7 and 0.3. And then here you have, um, sorry, I keep just going back and forth. Um, <laughs> Yeah, if, I think yeah. if you exclude it, you're forcing it to be zero. So the line, the, the line that you have to fit has to go through zero. Exactly. Um, so it's, yes, so yeah. it's, this is a little confusing, this statement. Um, it's really confusing when, uh, when you do that, trying to interpret it after doing that. Uh, reword. Um, reword. 
like it says you can remove it conveniently but when you go and try to explain what that means what your results mean it becomes a lot more complicated i've read a lot about that trying to do a meta-analysis and but my question is um and this is when i also done why why would you want to remove the intercept why not just keep it and it'd be something about initial conditions because then Imagine the scenario that you have a tree with a height of zero, the girth mm -hmm. of zero. If you have the intercept being some more constant, then that will say your tree has a volume of minus 69, minus 60 something, which realistically, well, where would you find that? Like, does, does it doesn't make sense though, to have a tree with, those, with that volume. Do. So if you set it to three, you're saying, okay, it's a tree with a height of zero, a girth of zero, it has a zero, a zero volume. So uh, that that's the sense. explanation I'll give it to it. And this think, makes sense. Yeah, I think in this scenario, it makes sense because like you said, it, it's impossible, it would be impossible to have negative volume of a tree, right? Yeah, so. I, I really like that explanation. It's, yeah, it's context specific and, but really most of the time, I like even here, I don't think it, it would matter to not set the initial conditions as long as whatever you're using the model for, you're not extrapolating in that direction out of your data because then you would get silly answers. But really the model's allowed to do silly stuff out of the space that you are looking at it, I think. So is that, so we should kind of only really do that if the initial conditions of what is being measured allow for it to make sense to do that? And just avoid it otherwise. I think so. I've never, I, I've never removed, removed, or I'm just gonna say forced the intercept to be zero before. Hmm. I've kind of just used it, kept it as it. I've always kept it as it is, even if, even if the line, like the regression line, for example, like in the plots, don't contextually make sense given like of the range of the data. I've just kind of kept my extrapolation in within scope. Yeah, yeah, I think, so I guess the only case would be if we wanted from our data about medium-sized trees to know about volumes of very, very small trees, then we might want to fix it because, because otherwise it would, it would be saying silly things. But that's a risky thing yeah. to do anyway because we're, we're kind of talking about a totally different space. Right. Yeah. That makes this sense. is completely contextual. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, guess, I almost yeah. want to say, like, I'm not a huge fan of this section because it's almost implying, like, oh, I, if, if you don't really know what you're doing, if you're learning this for the very first time, oh, let me just throw out the intercept. Yeah. In my model that could lead to something you don't want. Okay. reporting the wrong results for a long time i've done it don't do it unless you know what you're doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i might put in a new pull request <laughs> um or we can bring it up in discussion on slack with the other couple points that i've uh, that we've, we've discussed um okay so moving forward again um Adding it so they use out of the categorical column so that we can uh, that can be illustrated the convenience of encoding. So um, he uh, adds a new variable called uh, group, uh, which is a random sample of the first four letter letters of the alphabet, um, setting the seed to forty two, which you would want to do for reproducibility. Uh, always set your seed. Um, you're generating a random sample. Um, let's see, so this is what you end up getting. So now you have a new uh, column called group and it is the same formula essentially. It, this is the convenience of the LM function is that when a categorical variable, variable is uh, input, um, essentially, models don't handle categorical variables. They only handle numeric data. So they, if the model, uh, function will automatically encode or dumbify um, the 
categorical variable to be a sequence of zeros and ones, depending on, with one group being the reference. Um, so we can have, uh, the, um, in this example, group A is the reference. So um, in theory, if you have the, um, the information for, for group B, C, and D, you can, um, if you can get what group A is. Um, so, that, so that would be the reference. Um, and so he uh, visualizes, he, he illustrates this, uh, how this is done by model.matrix. So I guess under the hood, um, LM calls upon model.matrix to essentially do exactly what I just said, where it creates four new, uh, three new columns, um, with group A being the reference, um, and signifying zero and one for where group B, so in observation five, um, this tree is part of group B, so it is marked by one. And every these are all zeros for this particular group. Um, uh, and then, okay, so then I added this little chunk here so that I can visualize the inclusion of a polynomial term. Um, now that there is a third variable, which is a categorical to demonstrate the second and third degree interactions. Uh, not, so, I mean, not with the intention of complicating things, but it just didn't make sense when there was only two variables that were continuous. Um, but now you can see when you have, um, when you include the polynomial, like the shorthand, you can see that there is girth, height, group B, C, and D independently. But then you get girth with height, girth, girth with B, C, D, then height with B, C, D, then the three-way interactions between them. So you get second and third degree interactions. Um, so that that is uh, now you can see what that would look like. Uh, okay, so to recap, <laughs> the uh, purpose of an R model formula is that you are that it allows you to find the find the columns that you want to use, the roles that the columns are. Um, the roles of those columns and the standard R machinery that is used behind the scenes to, for example, for example, encode the columns um, into an appropriate format. So moving on. Um, so there are ways to inspect and to um, modify your models. Um, the plot function uh, can take a model object. So when you use the LM function, you're returned with a model object. If you just do class as that um, thing, it'll you'll get my own model, <laughs> LM model. Um, so uh, there are four main diagnostic plots that's produced by plot. You have the residual versus fitted plot, um, and you can it plots the residuals versus the, it is like it says, to see if they, if there are nonlinear patterns. So it's a, it's a fairly good sign if you see your residuals equally spread out around a horizontal line without really much distinct pattern. So the residual line like would be here around zero, but this uh, line has a V shape. Um, so I wouldn't, but the residuals are kind of plotted around. So uh, I mean, as in like random, um, you get a normal QQ plot to see if both sets of residuals are identical. Um, so if the line is straight enough, then you can say that both sets come um, from normal distributions. So this is fairly straight. So we can see that, um, um, the, the data is normal. Um, there, then there's a scale location plot to see if the residuals are spread evenly along the range of predictors. This is a good plot to check for assumptions of homoscedasticity. Um, of equal, so that's equal variance is one of the assumptions. Um, and then there's a residual versus leverage plot. That's option four. So that gives you um, uh, 
Cook's distance. So it calculates Cook's distance and you can identify influential cases. So if you have um, a dot, if you have like some of these little um, dots far off from Cook's distance, the Cook's distance lines, um, then those cases are probably highly influential to the um, to the outcome. Um, and so these are examples. So they, this is using just the uh, the um, reg fit model, which is just the volume um, as a product of height and girth. And we're looking at residual versus fitted. It seems normal, but I would question goodness of fit here. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, he mentions here, the second plot does not show, show a strong violation of the normality assumption. However, the first plot shows a violation of linearity, um, meaning that there is a linear relationship between the response and the predictors. So if they were satisfied, you would see a horizontal line oops, horizontal line across uh, going across block, uh, zero. Um, then you can essentially use ggplot, the ggfortify package to do the same things. So ggfortify has a function called autoplot, which takes essentially the same um, um, the same input, which is a model object, and you can specify which two plots you want to see, which is one and two are um, the residual versus fitted in a normal QQ plot, but uses GV plot instead of base R's plot. Um, so a little bit more clarity. Um, let's see. So, but what about the coefficients? Um, you can call upon the summary. Uh, oh, hold on. Got another little meme for you over here. Uh, <laughs> do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> Um, I need to give a shout out to Tony for giving us a little bit of uh, comic relief uh, through this information a little bit uh, can get a, a bit deep. So um, you basically can just call on the summary function as you would um, any data um, and get the uh, some summary metrics such as uh, look at the the quartiles of the residuals, the all the coefficients, the standard errors, t values, and p values, um, and f is six and r squared value, for example, and then the number of degrees of freedom. Um, but if you want a more tidier version, there is the Broom package that helps you tidy up uh, your data. Um, and when applied for and when applied to a model object, it turns this mess into a tibble, <laughs> which is quite convenient. So I really like this a lot about um, the convenience with the tidy uh, with the tidy uh, with the tidyverse. Um, so you can have this clean table and then you can also use the glance and glimpse functions to essentially generate um just a one by 12 uh which gives you um like just one long uh tip i guess table with its um with all the metrics um, additional metrics that you would need. Okay, so moving forward, um, let's see. So uh, using the per and dplyr uh, lets you scale your modeling process. So essentially you can do, but it lets you do, um, within the per package, there is a function called map that lets you apply a function across um, different, a list of objects um, or um, a vector. That's usually the class classes that they accept as the first argument. Um, so essentially, oh wait, here's another one. Um, but does it scale? 
Uh, so essentially what we want to do is compare the models that we made before. So we have the model, the, the, the regular model where we're just looking at growth and height. We have the model with the interaction term included. We have the model with the polynomial uh, factor included. We have the um, model without the height and we have a model with no intercept. So all five of those models, essentially he took the output of those and put them as a list and path and pipe that into map DFR, which is returns actually a data, a row binded data frame. Um, map usually returns a list, but if you use DFR, that is data frame that is row binded and then apply and then apply glance to uh, from the broom package to um, each of these items in the list, keeping uh, uh, the naming the main column ID. So there is an argument to map all the map functions that is that ID which allows you to uh, rename your um, your uh, the column your output column. Um, and then he just selected that and the R squared value. So we only they, he only wanted to look at the R squared to see how well the models um, fit. Um, and then you, you're returned with the five by two table and with the, poly, the, polynomial, the polynomial model having the best fit with the R squared value of 97. Um, 0.97, uh, but to me, they all fit, fare very well. These are pretty high R squared values um, regardless. So if it's if the poly has the best fit, that means there's kind of like a exponential relationship between the two, right? I mean, which would kind of make sense for trees because they get much, much taller than they get wide. That makes sense. Actually, I'm, I'm not, I don't know much about trees, but I could see why, yeah. Because I remember he had the, the identity function with height squared. Yeah. I think that's what it was. So yeah, that makes sense. They get taller faster than they get wider. Yeah. So, totally. Okay. So, um, so essentially what he wants, uh, so essentially what we're doing next is creating a model for each group. So remember we uh, created a new column called group that is a categorical variable. And instead of um, adding, adding that and looking at adding that to the model, essentially creating four individual models for each group. So you can use group nest, which is, uh, at, I believe, from Dplyr, which allows you to um, separate uh, the data, your data based on a specific column. Just so happened that this variable is called group um, and returns a table of tibbles. So if I were to just run this part, uh, this would be um, trees, uh, reg, reg fits would be um, a table uh, with four rows, one for each uh, group. And each of those rows has a table. So it's a table of tibbles. You're basically subsetting by each group, subsetting your data by each group. Um, and then he's creating new columns, which include fit, tidy, glanced, and augmented. So fit is basically fitting a linear model on just that group. So you're ma mapping the data, um, which is this, um, the data set, the, su the subset of data, uh, and you're applying that data to the LM function with the same outcome. Then tidied is mapping this new, uh, fitted model to the to the tidy um, function from Broom. I mean, from yeah, I think that was from Broom. Yeah, from Broom. Glanced uh, 
returns a row summary of the models, which is like a one row summary. Um, and then augmented actually returns a table of additional metrics that are not, um, not typically included as the output in a, um, in a model. So metrics like Cook's, Cook's distance, so the lower and upper bounds of fitted value, standard error, et cetera. Um, and then he creates this, um, and this is one thing that I didn't fully understand. He, he creates a, a helper function. Um, so he put the period in front of select on nest. I would have just left this as a regular function. Um, I've only had to create these hidden functions when in package development, but um, anyways, this function, what it does is you it takes some data and you have the lazy dots and it just selects uh, base, uh, selects the group and unnests it because it's going to return, these are gonna return lists, right? Map returns lists. And so unnest that list so that you're left with uh, data frames. So for example, you basically take the reg fits object um, and apply the select unnest function to the tidy column, um, which is a list. That it basically, it's a list vector. It's a, it's a vector of lists. And uh, you returns a tibble, uh, a 12 by 6 tibble. So you get um, um, each of the groups summary, like model summary stats. Does that make sense? <laughs> All right, cool. Um, and so apply the same thing to glance and uh, you have one row per group with each of these R squared, adjusted R squared, sigma, P values, et cetera. And then you, um, you have the augmented one, which gives you a lot more information. Um, you get uh, fitted residual, standard residuals, hat, sigma, cooks, distance. Um, for, for each, there's 31. Um, Now this one, I don't quite understand why there are 31 rows. Growth, volume, growth, and height. And if that's the original data, this is for every, I just put another question mark next to this one. Okay. Um, all right, moving forward. Um, so some more base uh, and stats, more stuff that comes out of base and the stats uh, packages. So to see if your model, uh, if you wanna compare the performance of both two different models, you can do a quick ANOVA uh, to compare the variances. So if you wanted to look at the regular uh, fitted model versus the polynomial. And um, just to remind you, this is what they, those models look like. And the um, girth does indeed provide significant explanatory power to the model. So what uh, um, we were just talking, what we were just discussing earlier about how Stephen was mentioning how it makes sense um, oops, sorry, how it makes sense that, um, actually that was height. So girth was the exponential, the one that was exponential. Um, but yeah, it's, it's highly significant. The model with the exponential term is highly significant. So, uh, apparently it provides significant explanatory power to the model. Um, and what is ANOVA? Oh, no, we don't like that. Huh? I like that. Eh? It's all regression. Daddy, 
Jam, I think oh, your mic is unmuted. <laughs> All right, so um, then we get into uh, a little bit of conceptually. Um, if you have one uh, set that, like uh, two different sets that are independent, identically distributed, have followed a uniform distribution, what is the distribution of their, um, when you combine them? So we, it's highly conceptual because I haven't had stats in a very, very long time, but he creates two uh, uniform distributions and uh, of 1000, um, link 1000, setting your feet again, don't forget that. Uh, and then writes a function to plot the histogram, include the probability, and then add the density lines in blue with a um, line weight of two um, using root. Um, again, as a hidden function, this I'm not so sure why he does this. Um, so essentially creates a matrix of these histograms to uh, show what it looks like. So we have um, one, two, and I think there's three. One, two, three, three, two, two. I don't necessarily understand this matrix uh, layout, but Regardless, um, when you look at the histogram of the first dis the first uniform distribution, the second uniform distribution, and the combination of both distributions, you get like a per almost a perfectly like normal um, distribution. He says it's triangular. Um, There are a lot of pro there's a lot of functions that you didn't even know you needed. So, um, I like adding a column if you want to quickly add a column to a data frame. Um, I think this was going that part kind of dropped off. <laughs> um, and then tidy principles added to tidy models. So um, there are the tidyverse was as we was mentioned in our last um, our last book club about the tidyverse primer. It's human centric, so we um, it's meant to be functions are meant to be sensible by default. So we don't want to make the user uh, choose um, something that must be specific. That, must make sense and must be specified like a file path. Um, specifically, the recipes and the parsnip um, packages enable data frames to be used everywhere where in the modeling where uh, in the modeling process um, versus uh, which are more convenient than working with matrices and vectors. Uh, they're consistent, so you can learn about one function or package. Whatever you learn from that can be applied to another in, within the tidy ecosystem, um, but also includes object-oriented programming. Um, so basically, no need to rewrite functions that already exist within uh, um, within R, such as predict. Right. So there's no reason to rewrite a predict function if that one uh, works perfectly well already. Um, then we have uh, an example here is uh, broom, uh, using Broom's tidy function. Um, its output is very consistent and list outputs provide by package specific functions vary. So just kind of like comparing the two, um, you get a lot things outside of the tidy ecosystem are often variable in what they output. Um, it's composable, so you can often like break them down into small pieces, or you can pipe them in. So 
you can create basically as we've seen already with the um the creation of the new variable through the trees data uh, data frame and then using different kinds of uh, mapping different functions to the fitted model um, and then piping that so basically the uses of composing multiple functions together um, it allows for simplicity and um, it reduces error um, your your risk of making or type mistakes um, because of things that are not compatible, objects that are not compatible together. Um, so yeah, recipes, parsnip, tune, dials, they're all packages that are separate, but when using a tidy development workflow, um, uh, it's useful for, these. this paradigm is useful for decomposing a whole model of design process and makes, make, makes problems feel more manageable. And finally, it's inclusive. Um, because the tidyverse is not just a collection of packages, but it's also the community of people who use them. Receptive to public feedback, which is we've seen already. So um, that's it. That that wraps up chapter three. Um, yeah, um, I have a very simple question, please. Um, so why are these packages like tidyverse and tidymost are called opinionated opinionated or what? <laughs> yeah why are they called these are they not accept, uh, acceptable by um base r community or why do they have different way of calling them opinionated why opinionated yeah i mean the tidyverse and tidy models um, they are called opinionated packages, right? Um, so we have many packages. All packages are called packages. But mm -hmm. these packages in particular, they are called opinionated. Why are they referred as opinion? Are they not act, I mean, acceptable by the base R community? Or why are they called? Uh, why, why are they referred in this way? Yeah, I don't know. But what I do know is that there are basically two philosophies in our programming. <laughs> I know a lot of programmers, like our programmers, uh, where I work that refuse to adopt the tidyverse at all. Like they are just based R 100%. Um, not, I can't, I can't tell them why. Um, and the then they're the reason why um, it's called opinionated is because there's a very specific philosophy behind how um, tidyverse packages are created and structured. And a lot of that is to do with the language in, um, in the tidyverse being more human centric so that humans can more easily understand cognitively what is going on. Whereas with a lot of the base R functions, when you actually interpret them as a human, they don't actually make an awful lot of sense. So it makes it really hard to understand. That's Hadley Wickham says. One of the problems or the barriers to learning uh, about statistical coding is the fact that people feel like they're stupid because um, they don't understand the code. Whereas Tidyverse is designed to make it as simple as possible to understand, um, to understand what you're doing and how the code all links together. And it makes it a lot easier to learn and a lot easier to do analysis in, in general, even though it's slightly slower. Right. Uh, think of it this way. Base R is more designed for the computer and uh, Tidyverse is more designed for the human. I like that response a lot. So I'm not sure, I'm not a fan of, make, of opinionated. <laughs> it seems uh, quite judgmental. I don't think, yeah, it depends on how, how you take that word. I think, yeah, it's just, it, I mean, it's strong opinions, but not necessarily, it's no negative context, I guess, but that it's not intrinsically truth, right? Yeah, I like all this answer. Thanks for hosting, that was great. Yeah, thank you.